Dear Chairman, dear ladies and gentlemen, non-compaction and overlap syndromes. This is my conflict of interest slide. I'm a consultant to Circle Cardiovascular Imaging Incorporation. I do not think that this is relevant for this talk. What is left ventricular non-compaction? Left ventricular non-compaction is characterized by prominent myocardial trabeculations and deep intertrabecular recesses that communicate with the ventricular cavity, as can be seen in this patient here with these uh, large amounts of trabeculations. Because of this appearance, other terms often found in the literature um, include spongy myocardium, left ventricular hypertrabeculation, and many others. Left ventricular non-compaction can lead to chronic cardiac failure, malignant arrhythmias, and thromboembolic events. This patient here, as you can see on the early guard images, and also here suspect on the cine image, has got an uh, LV apical thrombus. This is a patient who presented with very fast developing heart failure symptoms, and then finally presented with the symptoms of a leg embolus. The pathophysiology is not very well understood. These images here show human hearts at different stages during the uh, um, uh, embryolo embryological development. You can appreciate at the very early stage that you've got a very, very thick trabecular layer or non-compacted layer and a very thin compact layer. This then changes in ratio to a more compact, thicker compact layer and a thinner trabecular layer. Because of these changes, it is assumed that really left ventricular non-compaction is a reflection that the non-compacted myocardium likely represents an embryological arrest of normal myocardial compaction. However, the mechanisms leading to cardiac failure remain unknown. What do we know from echocardiography? The prevalence is presumed 0.05% or 1 in 2,000 in the adult population. The distribution of trabeculations and left ventricular non-compaction has been described as predominantly um, affecting the left ventricle, but it can also affect the right ventricle. Erwin Oechslin in Jack 2000 described that the distribution of trabeculations may help in differentiating left ventricular non-compaction from normal hearts uh, in the fact that he described that um, the trabeculations occur in 80% in the apical um, segments or the midventricular level in the inferior lateral aspects. However, it's important to remember that in about two-thirds of normal hearts, um, prominent trabeculations can be found on post-mortem studies. Echocardiography has developed uh, three main diagnostic criteria for non-compaction. Um, the Jenny criteria are probably the most widely known. That's the non-compaction to compaction ratio of greater than two in short axes in systole. And this schematic shows you the trabricated layer is also called the non-compacted layer. And the compacted layer is uh, this yellow box here, which in the chin criteria is called X. But essentially the non-compacted to compacted ratio, if that's greater than two in systole, is consistent with the diagnosis of non-compaction. The chin criteria, so say, are slightly different. Um, it's the compacted layer, or X, divided by Y, which is the sum of the non-compacted layer plus the compacted layer. So um, it's essentially a, a, a ratio the other way around. So if that ratio is less than 0.5, uh, that fulfills the criteria. The Stolberg criteria are somewhat more semi-quantitative. Um, if there are more than three trabeculations protruding the left ventricular wall apically to the papillary muscles and visible in a single image plane. Now we propose some cardiac MR diagnostic criteria in 2005 and proposed to use the non-compaction compaction ratio in excess of 2.3 when measured in diastole in long axis, so either the four-chamber, three-chamber or the two-chamber view. Um, this uh, differentiated the group quite nicely from all the other groups studied here. Uh, a similar study confirmed our findings, but using a slightly different parameter on cardiac MRS, the Jacquier group, uh, the, the paper by Jacquier and colleagues. 
they found that uh, the trabeculated myocardial mass as a percentage of LV mass, if in excess of 20%, differentiated very nicely the non-compaction group from the other forms of cardiomyopathy or healthy controls. Both of these cardiac mass studies looked at the value of the distribution of trabeculations, and what you can see here is plotted for the different groups, including non-compaction subjects, healthy subjects, cardiomyopathies, and forms of hypertrophy. Um, you found that the pattern of trabeculation presence was the same uh, in all groups. So most commonly occurring in the apex, mid-ventricular level, slightly less common, and particularly the basal and septal segments hardly ever involved. Um, and this is really consistent what Oxlin described, but what this shows us that the distribution really cannot help in distinguishing uh, non-compaction from other groups. And this was essentially confirmed by, the, by Jacquier and colleagues, again similarly plotting the presence of trabeculated layers uh, in subjects in these different uh, cardiomyopathies and controls compared to non-compaction. Now the title of my talk was Non-Compaction and Overlap Syndromes, and I think non-compaction can overlap with many, many, many conditions including the normal heart, abnormal chordae, tendinia, incomplete penetrance of non-compaction, myocardial infarction when a region of war motion abnormality occurs and in that area then uh, trabeculations may be more prominent, takotsubo, dilated cardiomyopathy, and on the other hand we've got congenital heart disease, hypertensive heart disease, apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and a very interesting group of genotype positive, phenotype negative, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I'll show you some examples um, where we feel there may be an overlap between non-compaction and these conditions. Now, this is a very elegant uh, study by James Moon, published uh, in 2004 in Heart, where they looked at a small number of subjects that had normal echocardiograms, native echocardiograms, um, but very abnormal ECGs with significant T-wave inversions. And there was a very large proportion of those patients when they underwent cardiac MR that could be identified of having a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So what this really shows is the strength of cardiac MR to assess the apex, which using native echocardiography um, often has the near field artifact and is limited in the assessment. Um, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy genotype positive phenotype negative uh, group can also overlap. As you can see here, you can identify sometimes very regional trabeculations in the infraceptal wall in patients that are positive for the genotype for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy but do not have hypertrophy or vert hypertrophy. Uh, and this was described in a few studies by the Van Rossum group in Amsterdam. Abnormal chorda tendinia, as in this echo example, uh, can be mistaken for trabeculations. An apical thrombus on native echo uh, may mimic it, but even on um, cardiac MR, may actually, this haziness here may uh, mimic a non compacted layer, but it turns out on early garden lithium enhancement images that this was an apical thrombus. An apical tumor, again, was mistaken in this case for left ventricular non compaction. This very interesting case of congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries was uh, kindly given to me by um, Vivek Muturangu from Great Ormond Street Hospital. And again, it can quite nicely show that uh, this ventricle here actually looks like it's non-compacted, but in fact it's just a CCTGA. Now, very recently, um, this very interesting paper by the MESA uh, investigators was published in Circulation Cardiovascular Imaging looking at healthy population in the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis in fact in 1,000 of the 6,000 people and simply measured the non-compaction compaction ratio as described in the um, in my paper in uh, Jack 2005 and they found that a large proportion of subjects had uh, fulfilled this criterion but fewer subjects fulfilled it if it was present in more regions. So what they uh, 
suggested was that a ratio of trabeculate layer to compact myocardium of more than 2.3 is common in a large population-based cohort, and that these results suggest re-evaluation of the current CMR criteria for non-compaction may be necessary. Now, I think I would agree with that conclusion for those subjects that do not have a high pretest probability that are incidental findings on cardiac MR, and I will show you why I believe this is. Now, if you go back to my study, or our study published in 2005, we were able for this non-compaction compaction ratio greater than 2.3 to show a sensitivity and specificity of 86% and 99% respectively. But it's very important to remember that the posterior probability or the likelihood of disease of non-compaction, or also called the positive predictive value, depends very much on the pretest probability or the prevalence. Now, I've, I've given you this uh, study by Ritter et al. that uh, suggested on ECHO that the presence prevalence might be 1 in 2,000. There is a formula which uh, you can find in any statistical textbook which shows you how to calculate this likelihood of disease, um, which includes sensitivity, specificity, and the pretest probability. So if you plug in numbers and you say, I've got a 1 in 2,000 chance of having this condition so in the population, then your posterior probability, despite these um, respectable diagnostic accuracy um, measures, is only 4%, so 1 in 25. However, if you assume a 50% pretest probability, then you have a 99% posterior probability or likelihood of disease. So it's very important to take into account the pretest probability. So what I would say is that the non-compaction compaction ratio criteria are very valid for those subjects where you have a high pretest probability, but maybe not if it's an incidental finding um, on your cardiac MR scan. And maybe those um, um, thresholds should be more stringent. So that really highlights the importance of family history. If you've got a, a family like this where this patient um, was the index patient and has a non-compaction ratio of 2.4 uh, and has been diagnosed with non-compaction. Father has been diagnosed with non-compaction um, and suddenly you would uh, investigate this subject here. If you have a non-compaction ratio of greater than 2.3, you would have a 1 in 2 chance, assuming that this is an autosomal dominant pattern and your posterior pros uh, probability would be 99%. If this was a complete random subject, your um, probability would be far less, only 4%. Now, in this case, the non-compaction ratio was 1.6, and um, probably not enough to make a diagnosis in this subject. These are the images of this family um, where we've got the index patient with a very clear non-compaction ratio. But interestingly, another concept is if you've got genetic conditions, it's frequent that there's something that's called incomplete penetrance. So you have some uh, presentation phenotype of non-compaction, but not to the extent uh, that you would see in others. So despite the fact that this doesn't fulfill the non-compaction compaction criteria of 2.3, given the family history, this subject almost certainly has uh, left ventricular non-compaction. This is a very interesting case of a typical presentation of Tako Tsubo, a female patient uh, following a stress event that had a troponin rise, normal unobstructive coronary arteries, um, and had this apical ballooning, as you can see here, and end diastolic and end systolic volumes with the um, lack of contraction. You can appreciate the non-compaction layer here, which um, was just positive at 2.4. If you then followed this patient up, or when this patient was followed up a few months later, um, the contractility had um, recurred, and the non-compaction ratio at, um, in diastole actually was uh, not significant anymore, 1.5. So what this case highlights is that maybe there's a temporary phenotype of non-compaction. Maybe we need to be careful in acute trepiculation uh, assessment when there's an acute wall motion abnormality. Um, I believe that in chronic um, dilatation or wall motion abnormality, these trepidations disappear because they get stretched out with the LV dilatation. 
as in our study and in Jacquier's study, um, the extent of non-compaction to compaction ratio was not different to all the other groups um, when compared to non-compaction. So I think this is an acute warm motion abnormality and therefore you, it appears as if the ratio is, is uh, uh, diagnostic for non-compaction. Now are we over or under reporting non-compaction? In the absence of a real gold standard, we are all prone to the risk of circular argument, including Jacquier's paper and my paper and all the ECHO studies. We still don't know whether non-compaction or the trivigulations are an epiphenomenon or a distinct entity of cardiomyopathy. Very important is to study the natural progression of non-compaction with normal ejection fractions. The verdict is out whether there's a temporary non-compaction phenotype but if the pathophysiological mechanism is correct, that it's an embryological arrest, this seems counterintuitive. Left ventricular non-compaction in the context of warm motion abnormality uh, needs to be better understood. My belief is that if you've got an acute warm motion abnormality, you may feel that there's a larger trabeculation extent. In a chronic setting, this probably isn't the case anymore. Now my conclusions, CMI imaging offers high diagnostic accuracy for non-compaction based on the ratio of non-compacted compacted myocardium. When you measure the diastolic non-compaction compaction ratio and it exceeds 2.3, this is particularly the case uh, for um, higher pretest probability. The pattern of distribution of non-compaction is not a useful discriminator to diagnose non-compaction. I believe that CMI does not replace a thorough family history and screening of family members at risk which helps you um, judge the pretest probability. There are many unresolved questions. For this reason, we are planning to um, launch a left ventricular non-compaction protocol as part of the Euro CMR registry to answer most of these questions listed here. So if you're participating in the Euro CMR registry in a different protocol, you may wish to, in the near future, also contribute to this protocol. If you're not contributing, uh, contributing at all yet, um, you may wish to get in touch with the um, principal investigators of the European CMR registry um, to get set up to contribute to this very important registry. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and my colleagues at the London Chest Hospital and Barts for um, all their hard work and uh, just being nice colleagues. Thank you.